The year 2016 marks the 40th anniversary of the Ukrainian Museum. It is especially apt that an exhibition of the works of Jacques Nizdowski is an important part of the museum's year-long celebration. Nizdowski embodies the ethos of post-World War II Ukrainian artists of the diaspora, ranking among the generation's most accomplished and distinguished figures. Nizdowski's stylized vision of the natural world is at once direct, accessible, and eloquent. The authority of his vision, its completeness, clarity, and persuasiveness suggests an individual whose artistic growth was seamless, almost preordained. Yet to read the artist's own account of his journey in an essay, Reflections of, of the Artist, is to become aware of his moments of crisis and deep doubt, to marvel at his clear-eyed recognition of his dilemmas, shortcomings, inabilities to find answers, and to admire his resolve to persevere and become an artist on his own terms. I would like to explore with you in this presentation the critical junctures of his career and the seminal works that elucidate the artist's journey of struggle, discovery, and grace. Nizdowski's place of birth would leave an important impact on his creative growth. He was born on January 27, 1915, in the village of Pilipce in the Borshchev region of Ukraine, whose rich folk art tradition, strongly dominated by black and white, patterning, often interspersed with accents of color, is one of the boldest among the regions of Ukraine. The beauty of the region's visual poetry remained with the artist throughout his career. It appears in many permutations in his work, in his woodcuts, as well as in his paintings. Hnizdowski began his formal training in 1938 when with the aid of Metropolitan Andrei Sheptitsky, he was accepted to study painting at the Academy of Fine Arts in Warsaw. The outbreak of World War II and its immediate impact on Poland forced him to leave the Academy. After a brief stay in Rome, which he found too expensive, he traveled to Zagreb, Croatia, the former Yugoslavia, where in 1939 he enrolled at the Academy of Arts and Crafts. The choice of the city was fortuitous, for unlike many major European cities, the cataclysm of the war did not reach Zagreb, making it a relatively safe haven and a congenial place to hone his skills. He received his degree in 1942 and continued at the Academy for another two years. By mid-20th century, the art academies had succumbed to the ascendancy of modern art. Where they still existed, as in Zagreb, they provided solid grounding in anatomy, theory, history, and practice of art, preparing the more talented students for the inevitable confrontation with modernism. During this period, Nizdowski discovered the woodcuts of Albrecht Dürer, and under their influence began to experiment with the medium as evidenced in the woodcuts from 1944 of expressive heads and half-length figures in prayer. In 1944, Nizdowski also created two woodcuts, Bush and Forest, which are his earliest treatments of forms in nature in this medium. In both, the artist views the motifs from close proximity. Bush is the more dramatic and monumental, as the leafless, varied branches create an intricate pattern that define the whole, establishing an archetype that the artist will reprise in many of his later woodcuts of trees. Forest is a more lyrical composition of groupings of thin, gently swaying trees whose branches weave a delicate lace-like motif and create an animated swaying silhouette against the sky. In this work, we can see an affinity to similarly rendered trees 
endures works. After leaving Zagreb, Nizdowski reconnected with the Ukrainian community in displaced persons DP camps near Munich, where he stayed until his departure for the United States in 1949. While there, he did graphics and layouts for ARCA, a Ukrainian literary and arts monthly published in Munich in 1947-48, edited by Professor Yuri Shevilov. Nizdowski also designed posters, illustrated books, and authored many ex libris designs. All this allowed him to explore the compelling interaction between image and word. The Ex Libris collection in this uh, exhibition of Roman Ferencevich underscores the limitless inventiveness of Nizdowski's imagination as he transformed letters of the alphabet and other imagery into compelling works of art. The collection also addresses the artist's deep immersion in the community of individuals and institutions of which he was a part and for whom his ex libris and logos serve as their public face. Among them is the Ukrainian Museum. Nizdowski's major painting of the European phase of his career is Displaced Persons of 1948. In it, he achieves a new level of visual discourse that manifests itself both in the composition of the painting and in the work's psychological acuity. He addresses the condition of the Ukrainian diaspora of post-World War II Europe by depicting six adults and two children on two three-tiered beds placed side by side against a wall. A narrow sliver of floor defines a shallow space with which the stark, undefined backdrop creates an existential context where the protagonists are suspended in time and place. The brilliant conceit of placing six individuals on beds, but one reclining, divides the composition into equal compartments and underscores their communal experience, echoing the reality of crammed living conditions and the accompanying loss of privacy, often the norm in DP camps. Scrawled on the wall above the man on the upper right are the years 1945, 1946, and 1947, all crossed out, and 1948 with a question mark. They symbolize and highlight the painting's central themes, the consuming stasis of the individual's lives and the coping strategies they employ, waiting for the ignorable future. The year is 1948, and they have long accommodated their reality. The strewn cluster of books near the man at upper right suggests a well-read man immersed in a well-established routine. The woman at the upper left, the wall behind her adorned with male portraits, her bra hung over the bed rail at her feet, looks into a handheld mirror admiring her youth and her beauty, unlikely for the first time. The two tears at lower right evoke a family as the man in the middle leans down towards the woman and her two young children, likely born in DP camps. If the seated man with feet in the tub clock at his feet suggests alertness, even tension, then the man above him, head propped up, staring blankly, cigarette in hand, embodies ennui. In 1947, a year prior to his completion of Displaced Person, Hnizdowski published an article in Arca on Peter Bruchel the Elder, titled Dance on Olympus, in which he explores the Dutch master's expansive expression of the human condition. Quote, viewing Bruchel's paintings of contemporary peasants, their life in all its manifestations, in all its marvelous intertwining, the viewer is not certain whether to laugh or to empathize with them. This double page of carefree humor and deep tragedy were brilliantly introduced into literature by Hohol three centuries later. And we could add by Nizdowski 
in his 1948 masterpiece of the European phase of his career. Gnizdowski arrived in America in 1949 and settled in St. Paul, Minnesota, where he secured a position as a designer in the advertising firm of Brown and Bigelow. This was the beginning of a tumultuous period in his life. By happenstance, he became aware and subsequently entered a graphic exhibition at the Minneapolis Institute of Art, where he received the second purchase prize for his woodcut, Bush. The exhibition was juried by A. Hyatt Mayer of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Soon thereafter, he once again won second prize at the Minneapolis State Fair for his painting, Eggs of 1944. Among the jurors was Yasuo Kuniyoshi, a Japanese emigre and one of America's preeminent modernist artists. At this moment in his career, Nizowski made a fateful decision that was at once quixotic and sober. On the basis of his limited success, he decided to quit his job and move to New York City to become a full-time artist. The evident naivete of this decision was balanced by his brave awareness that at age 35, he was at the crossroads. He chose to follow his passion. In New York, he quickly confronted the reality of financial survivability. More daunting was his confrontation with the overpowering presence of modern art. By 1950, New York had transcended Paris as the artistic capital of the world. Nizdowski was in the throes of a crisis of confidence. I had run into a blind alley. My work, my material hardship, which could hardly have been worse, was child's play compared to my inner crisis. The paradox of my situation was that as soon as I gained my independence, I realized I did not know what to do with it. I had decided to do nothing but paint, and I did not know how to paint. This acknowledgement that he had to move beyond his academic training unleashed a decade of work of exceptional quality in which the exploration of modern artists and movements is evident but never dominant. In the end, this was a liberating period for Nizdowski, with the awareness that the subject of his art and the manner of its creation is limitless, unencumbered, and up to him, he achieved the clarity of vision and direction. It is during the 1950s that Nizdowski re-engaged in printmaking by focusing on the medium of linocuts in which he also employed color. In works like Kiss and Maternity, he turns to themes made famous by modernists like Edvard Munch and Pablo Picasso. In these works, he shows his awareness of the potential of abstract forms and expressive color to forge images of powerful emotional resonance. Uh, the Kiss, a work in which once the circular pattern, the dynamic energy of the linocut and the expressive color yields the image of an embracing couple kissing, the impact of the viewer's revelation is that much more compelling. In maternity, the red backdrop heightens the emotional force of the bonding between mother and child. Here depicted in a brilliant conceit of smaller, round, and elongated black and white circular shapes subsumed into a larger elongated form, underscoring how transferable are these abstract forms into one of the most common and profound of human experiences. Nizowski's paintings from this period also resonate with an emotional energy of someone searching deeper truths. In his Icarus and Diver of 1954, of which there are two variants in the exhibition, the artist posits a human being in the middle of nature and another plunging into water's depth. The former thrusts his arms outward and upward, a gesture of embracing his surroundings. 
The probing of both are rich in promise, but also danger, as the ultimate fate of Icarus implies. An apt description of the artist's dilemma during his fervent search for resolution in his artistic journey. It is in this decade that Nizdowski also turns his attention to religious themes. His Last Supper of 1954 is one of a number of iterations of this theme by the artist. His Crucifixion of 1955 is his most compelling and powerful treatment of this universal theme. In its excruciating intensity, it may be compared to the anguished figure of Christ in Matthias Grunewald's celebrated Eisenheim altarpiece. In its visual language, the artist shows his awareness of trends in contemporary art of the period, especially on the focus on black. Artists like Robert Motherwell, Clifford Still, Mark Rothko, among many others, explore black not only as a formal vehicle, but as one that carries emotional and spiritual depth. In Nizdowski's work, black subsumes the image of Christ as it plunges life into death. The violated parts of Christ's body are depicted in isolation. From these, the blood flows down the black canvas in streaks of red that animate the work both visually and thematically. Only the sliver of yellow at the top may hint of resurrection and salvation. Some of Nizdowski's major themes are nature and cityscapes. His landscapes, both paintings and prints, range from the immersive experience of a lushly flowering cherry tree to the expansive vistas with each stalk of wheat and blade of grass accounted for. Among Nizdowski's seminal prints are renderings of singular trees of different varieties, isolated, leafless, and crowned by an intricate web of branches. They underscore his mastery of craft and nature. The cities that he chose to paint are mainly New York and Paris. Each had great resonance in his art and life. New York is the city to which he came in 1950 and where he settled. It was in New York where some of his most profound moments of creative growth occurred. In New York where he formed bond with the Ukrainian diaspora community and his fellow artists. It was in the Bronx Zoo and the Botanical Garden that he acquainted himself with what would become the subject matter of his art. Over the years, Nizdowski painted or made woodcuts of some of the city's most iconic buildings, among them Miss van der Rohe's Seagram building, the interior of the Guggenheim, the facade of St. John the Divine, a woodcut that the cathedral had used as its logo. More personal and telling, and referencing a different aspect of city life are views onto the back alleyways from a window of his Bronx tenement. In 1956, Nizdowski moved to Paris, where he would stay till 1958, and where he met and married Stephanie Kozan. It is interesting to note how many Ukrainian artists visited Paris in the last century to absorb its beauty and celebrate its artistic heritage. Archipenko, Hreschenko, Hordinsky, Moroz, Hutzeluk, and Kruchewski, among many others. Paris was a welcoming place for artists of uh, many nations and drew its energy from the rich interchange of ideas among them. To recall, Picasso is a Spaniard and Brancusi a Romanian, both deeply ingrained in the artistic ethos of Paris. Unlike the vertical energy of New York, Paris is a city much as it was in the mid-19th century, when Haussmann transformed its maze of medieval streets into a city of boulevards, parks, plazas, and bridges. Coming from New York's canyons, Mizdowski especially responded to the energy of its open spaces. His reductive treatment of the spatial expanse of the plazas 
or the perspectival rush of boulevards are among the most compelling interpretations of the city. Gnizdowski was especially drawn to the Paris Metro, which had opened in 1900. His many views of it focus on its unique architecture, but also on its function of moving people from place to place. Unlike his views of the boulevards and city proper, which are devoid of people. Here we meet the ticket seller or a cluster of Parisians entering the metro. During the 1960s, Gniezdowski turned his uh, attention to what I'd like to call his farmer's table or farmer's market theme of painting eggs, fruits, vegetables that are among his most accessible and admired works. They're often presented simply, usually in a basket or wooden crate, emphasizing them as Earth's bounty meant to be consumed. The strength of the paintings rest upon the artist's ingenious arrangement of the objects, as well as his ability to transform oil paint into a believable verisimilitude of an egg, a carrot, or a cabbage. Gnizdowski's exquisite paintings of individual breads belong broadly to this genre, yet they are distinctive by focusing on a human-made nourishment that carries symbolic meaning. By placing the bread centrally in simple settings, as he does on a cloth from Borschiv with red striations, he imbues the works with a degree of solemnity. Gnizdowski's most mature and accomplished works are his woodcuts on which he concentrated in earnest from 1960, and whose major subject is nature's flora and fauna. Stylization, a word often used as shorthand to define Gnizdowski's unique visual language, does not fully convey the artist's transformative iteration of the natural world. His plants and creatures are taken from nature, but are not of it they aspire to a different level of discourse with the viewer. The level of Gnizdowski's achievement was recognized by Peter A. Wick, curator of the Department of Printing and Graphic Arts of the Houghton Library at Harvard University, when he writes in 1976, the woodcuts of Jacques Gnizdowski represent some of the richest and most original printmaking in American graphic arts of the past 30 years. In the foreword, he also relates how he was first beguiled by Gnizdowski's work. I was first introduced to Gnizdowski through a large black and white woodcut of 1961, printed on a pure white Japanese paper, called simply Sheep, an enormous muff of fleece from which protruded at the top, rather shyly, a black muzzle, pointed ears, and blinking eye, and which was supported at the base by four ridiculously spindly black legs on delicate hoofs. Tenderly and charmingly, the very extraordinary unshorn sheepskin intrigued the eye <coughs> by the rhythmic waves of its fleecy locks. I decided at once that the disarming simplicity of this woodcut, with its compact contour and bestiary-like universality, concealed the artistry of a skilled craftsman in woodcutting, a craftsman who spent many hours gouging and scraping away at an immense pearwood block. I was instrumental in the acquisition of this woodcut for the print department of the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, where it frequently is exhibited. In this exhibition, the sheep is joined by zebras, a turtle, fighting rams, and a sleeping cat as demonstrations of the richness of Gnizdowski's vision. Gnizdowski has been the recipient of many prestigious awards, among them the Tiffany, the McDowell Colony, the Osabao Foundation Fellowships. His works are in many important private and public collections, which include the Cleveland Art Museum, the Davison Art Center at Wesleyan University, 
the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, the Philadelphia Museum, the White House, and Yale University. In 2015, in communities in the world where Ukrainians reside, the 100th anniversary of Nizdowski's birth was commemorated with exhibitions, symposia, and other events. This was especially true in many locales in Ukraine, to the degree that it is fair to say that Nizdowski is today the most recognized figure in Ukraine among the artists of the diaspora. Nowhere was there greater pride displayed than in his native region of Borshchiv. What the people of Borshchiv felt transcended the pride that the community feels for an accomplishment of a native son. In his art, they saw a validation of their creative heritage. Good night.